tries to roll over my bones when sorrow comes to steal the joy I want when brokenness and pain is all I know well, I won't be shaken no I won't be shaken cause my fear doesn't stand a chance when I
Come on, if he's your way maker, lift him up. Way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, hide in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, touching every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. 
Guys, this is not a, uh, a script. Um, Stephen, if you, I don't know if we can do this. Stephen, can you like repeat that last part just for a little bit? Just that even when we don't, we don't see it, he's working. And when we don't feel it, he's working. I feel like that needs to rest in someone's spirit this morning. And they're not quite done doing business with God. Atmosphere, God. Yes, Lord. God, we love your grace and we love your mercy. You know, we love the reality, even though we, even in times that we don't see your works around us, when we don't feel you in our spirit, God, we know that you are with us and you are doing a work in our day that even if you told us, we would not understand. God, we love so much the worship this morning. God, we love the last song that you just, that the word spoke that as the wind goes, God, we're gonna go. And God, because the wind has no will of its own, the, will, the, the wind simply does what you will it to do. And God, I pray in our hearts today for all the seasoned believers, God, that as the wind moves by your power and by your voice, that we will be people that move by your power and by your voice, that we will be allowing ourselves to be put in uncomfortable positions just so we can serve your name more, just so we can love you greater. And God, when you've called us to go, you we just go. Honey, you are our king and you are our Lord and we submit to you. Regardless of what we want, regardless of what's comfortable for us, God, we do what you've called us to do. But God, there are times in our lives where we just feel like we're just going through the season. I mean, nothing's going our way, nothing's going well, nothing's going right, and we just feel lost and broken and hurt and damaged and scarred. God, we, we love these words that even when we don't see it, God, you're still working. And when we don't feel it, God, you're still working. You're still our daddy in heaven who's never going to leave us or forsake us. And even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we will fear no evil because you are with us. Father God, I pray that right now in this moment, you would allow it to be a catalyst for someone's faith. God, I pray right now as people lay down their, their weapons, lay down their walls, lay down their, 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 their pride and allow ourselves to be vulnerable with your spirit and with people in this church, that we celebrate the reality that we are allowed to come as we are. God, I pray right now would be a callous for someone's heart and they can look back at this one worship session, watch it online, whatever it may look like for them, God, in their context and allow this to be a moment that they can look back at forever. God, we love you. God, we praise you. We need your power. We need your spirit. We need your grace. And Jesus Christ is in your sweet and holy and precious name that we have redemption, the forgiveness of our sins. And by your power, we have a spirit by whom we cry out, Abba, Father, because you've adopted us into your family. And Jesus Christ is in your name that we pray. Amen. I'm excited. If you're online, how are you guys doing? Sorry for being out of breath and sweaty. Sorry for yelling in your ears. You're watching online, your headphones, I apologize. And if you're online, you can give on our, online um, on, our, on our app, which is Grace City Mo, or on our website. You can go to the, the, the give button and you can give now right there. It's so great. You can also text to give. That's always exciting. Grace Church, we love you guys so much. Um, and as they're leaving, I have two things I want to tell you guys that's really, 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 really important. And another really, we love loving people at Grace City Church. And, and last year during Thanksgiving, 
uh, we did this thing. We gave out free turkeys. Anybody a part of that last year? Yeah, so last year we gave out right around 78 free turkeys, okay? So praise God for that. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, this year we have 100 people signed up, which is great, right? So give God a hand for that. We have 100 people that, that we're uh, guys allowing us to supply turkeys to. But we still need two things. This is really huge. One, I actually checked the books between services. One, we still need some money. So if you guys want to give financially, that would be great. But also, we need people, more importantly, to, to sign up to deliver turkeys. And that's such a great thing. What it is is I'll, I'll text you some name and addresses and their numbers, addresses and their numbers, and you can go out and deliver the turkeys. I'll buy the turkeys for you. You need to deliver them. And then whenever you do that, if that is you, I want to encourage you as you do that to encourage them and to love on them, to tell you that you know Jesus and you hope they know Jesus because he he's a great healer and mighty counselor. Amen. So do that. That would be awesome. And, and the last thing is we have this, this, this giving tree application out in the lobby by the TV, which is really, really important, okay? If you know someone or you yourself need a Christmas present this year for your kids, go out there, take some applications, take them to your friends, your neighbors, your schools, whatever, bring it back so we can load up a big old tree full of ornaments that so we can give out free presents to families in need this year. Amen. That's what we need. We need people actually to need presents. It's kind of weird. Like most churches, like they have too many people that need it and they turn people away. We're like, we actually need more people to get presents so we can give more presents away. So that's a great scenario. Um, really, really excited. Um, if you're new here, I'm sorry I'm talking a lot. If you're new here, there's a yellow You Belong Here card and a seat back in front of you. Spend 10 seconds, fill that out, turn it into the guest center. I'll text you um, just so we can welcome you to, to our church um, and we'll give you a free gift as well. Okay? Continuing on. I'm sorry there's so much to cover today. Continuing on. Um, today is hand-in-hand -hand offering. Okay? And what hand-in-hand -hand is, it's a really cool opportunity. Whenever we give to Grace City Church, you allow us to, to pour money into India and Guatemala and Honduras and everyone else in need through turkeys or Christmas presents or whatever. But hand-in-hand -hand offering, what it is, we're about to take it up right now. And what it is, is a second offering above your regular offering that goes just to people in our church that have need. Because we want to help people across the world, amen? We want to help people uh, across the globe, amen? And if we don't know them, we want to love on them and encourage them. However, we also want to make sure that we have funds set aside for people that call Grace Church home, that we can help if finances need it. So guys, start passing the bags. That would be great for that. And as they pass them, I encourage you to be praying over our finance team and our elders as they continue and continue to, to do things for us and, and to use the funds wisely, okay? Next thing, if you're a lady, this is awesome. Ladies, there's a ladies' day out coming up December 1st. This is, this is going to be awesome. I wish I could go but I'm a guy and there's shopping involved, so I'm kind of out on that. But there's going to be lunch as well. So December 1st, sign up to the front window. You guys are leaving December 1st. You guys are all taking a big, like, like van. You're going to go to St. Charles, do some shopping, do some eating, all to grow in fellowship and in knowing one another together. So it's December 1st. So go sign up with a sign-up window right now. Right when you walk out, left-hand sign, big old sign-up window, window. Go climb up. Uh, golly. I'm never talking again on stage, starting now. It's my last day. You'll never see me up here again. Um, but yeah, yeah, see you tomorrow, uh, next week. But so yeah, December 1st, that's awesome. And also, last announcement is really huge. If you come to Wednesday night service, this is really big. This Wednesday night is our last Wednesday night service until January. So we're really bummed about that, but we encourage you guys to come out, hang out this Wednesday night, bring, it's all ages, like little kids, all the way up to youth group, all the way up to adults, all the way up to adults, like parents of the parents, you know what I'm saying? It's going to be awesome. We, we're coming to Revelation right now. We're so excited to continue to worship together, as well as from two to six, we also have a church cleanup. We're going to spruce the church up and get ready for the holiday season. Let me throw up some decorations. I don't know exactly. I'm just going to show up and do what I'm told. Um, so we invite you guys out this Wednesday, 2 to 6 church cleanup, 6 p.m., last Wednesday night service of the season until January, okay? But anyways, I'm not preaching today. I'm just talking a lot, and I'm screaming at you, and I'm apologizing. I'm sweaty, and I'm stinky. Um, but guys, this morning we actually have um, one of my friends, his name is Pastor Terry. He's going to deliver the word today, and this is an awesome man of God. So guys, give it up for my friend, Pastor Terry. Amen. Good morning. Happy deer season. Huh? Amen. 
We was out. We were out last Friday, and all these people, campers and trailers and four wheelers and all this stuff is out. And my wife was like, "What is going on?" I said, "It's the second biggest holiday in Missouri. <laughs> it's deer season." But uh, so um, anyway, we've had a a great weekend. You know, God God tricked me this weekend. Nobody's ever had God trick you. Let me tell you my story. We was a uh, Pastor Kenny had asked me to speak um, months, uh, probably about two months ago. Well, I had in my mind that it was December 17th. Well, then yesterday we spoke for a young adult retreat in St. Louis for the Salvation Army. And I thought that date that they'd give me was November the 8th. So I'm like, I mean, all this time I'm thinking, opening weekend of deer season. I'm, this is awesome. Everything's around everything. It's never on that date. Well, then about a week and a half ago, Pastor Kenny goes, so you ready to speak? I'm like, yeah, I'm December. Whoa. He goes, what do you mean? I said, uh, what do you mean? He goes, Corey speak. I said, yeah, Corey's speaking on the 10th of December. I'm speaking on the 17th of December. He goes, Terry, it's November. I'm like, no. He goes, yes. I said, no. I would never volunteer to do that on opening day with your season. <laughs> well, then... Two weeks ago, I was talking to the captains about, and I'm thinking, November the 8th, last week, I'm so, I'm, it, it's an exciting time I was looking for, and all of a sudden, I realized that we get an email, and Johnny says, Terry, you do realize that you're speaking in St. Louis on November the 16th, and not November the 8th, or 15th, whatever, 7th, whatever it was, you know, and I'm like, what? I said, so the whole weekend <laughs> is now taken up. So, see, I think God tricked me because he, he kind of figured probably that Terry would probably say, oh, no, I'm busy that weekend. I've got so much to do that weekend. I can't do those things. So sometimes God sets us up, right? And, you know, the good news is when God does that, that means he's got a plan, church. And the great news is he wants to use all of us in that same way to bring that plan to guess and to pass. Amen? So we, uh, like I said, my life's not a... We, we, uh, yesterday when we were speaking for the young adult retreat, and I'll share some more in a little bit, but I guess because of we've been married for 28 years, and I guess we were, we were older. I'm not going to say the other word, but older. Um, you know, they wanted to speak to these. And a lot of these kids that have been coming to the camp, I've been there 11 years, so a lot of these kids are now are in college and just graduated. So I've known them since they were a little bitty. And uh, we was talking about relationships, you know, just uh, dating and all kinds of stuff. And. I had to look that up because it's been a while since my wife and I dated. We don't have date nights very often, but anyway, our date nights usually include about 200 other people at camp. We go down to the dining hall and have dinner. It's great. It's a nice place. Um, anyway, so I was talking to them yesterday, and I said, you know, God's got a sense of humor. You know, that's the good news, that God's got a sense of humor, right? I mean, if you don't believe it, look in the mirror, okay? Um, sorry, I was talking to myself there. Anyway, um, so we are, we're at this, I was telling about the first time Joey and I, when we first started dating, our first deer season together, my, um, my wife says, you know, I rented us a movie, you know, I said, well, I got to get home early, you know, I got to go to bed, it's deer season, you know. So this was about 1989, probably, something like that. Most of you weren't even born yet, but anyway, um, so we go to watch this movie and she puts, puts it in and it's, it's a VHS tape, so that tells you how long ago it's been. She puts it in, hits play, Bambi. <laughs> she goes, we're going to watch Bambi tonight. I said, oh, are we? And then after it's over and she goes, she goes, you wouldn't kill Bambi, would you? And I said, no, I wouldn't kill Bambi. But I would take his mom or his dad. I'm not too proud. I'll take either one of those. Amen. So, and just to show you how things have not changed that much. Two things happened yesterday morning. God's got a sense of humor. So the dogs wake up about 6 o'clock. Like I said, we're getting ready. We're going to Dave and Buster's. I'd never been there. That's where they held their retreat. They got a neat neat place, great you know, great place to, to do, and they got a nice meeting space where we got to, we had to deliver a message, and we got, the scary part was they had question and answers, so you just never know what the questions are going to be, so they kind of put you on the spot. But anyway, so from yesterday, you know, we started at 1030, and went all the way through 5 o'clock last night. 
And but anyway, so yesterday morning the dogs get up and they're wanting out, so I get up and let them out. And so I thought, well, I'm gonna go back in the bedroom for a minute. Well, they start barking. I'm like, oh, they're gonna wake everybody else up. We weren't supposed to get up to about seven. And I go out there and I go to the front door and I was like, stop, you know, quit. Well, they're just barking, scratching at the door, and I look on the hill, and there's a big old buck standing right out in front of my house. And I'm like, really? Today? You know, he just looking around like, hey, how are you? You know? So, so it was funny. But then we got ready to leave to go to St. Louis, and we're pulling out of the camp, and over in the field, there's a bunch of deer standing in the field. And Joni goes, and, you know, I didn't think, because they're always out there, and I didn't think too much about it, but we got ready to leave, and Joni goes, be safe, little ones. I'm rooting for you. And I'm like, really? So I realized that when I go, I got to be prayed up when I go deer hunting because our faith is battling one another right at that moment. When I go to the deer stand, she's in her prayer closet praying protection for the little deer. So, so anyway, so that's what I deal with. Anyway, I love her so much. I mean, just we, uh, and I was just trying to tell people yesterday about, you know, they always talk about, you hear people say, we're just not compatible. Well, we're humans. We're not compatible. You know? I mean, we really aren't in, in marriage and stuff because, first off, you got male and female. They're not compatible too much all the time anyway, right? So it is what it is. So just, you know, we just encouraging the young people, just don't look for someone that's like you. or what you, You'd be amazed what God will bring into you because he understands and knows what you need before you do. Amen? So be open to what God has to do. But anyway, so I got a picture. I was going to have Stephen pull up here for just a moment. Because I thought of this, and someone in here is going to get a kick out of this. You see a picture right there? That young guy there on the left. No, that's me on the right, that young guy over there. But this guy on the left, uh, that's Corey. And um, when we were pastoring a church, Corey was part of our youth group. And you see the young man next to him is Jake Youngblood. He's from Sullivan. And the guy in the gray sweatshirt with the guitar, that's uh, my son, Matt. And the young guy there on the right, that's me if you don't recognize me right there, the young guy. Uh, the good looking one right there. Anyway, uh, that's before I had a lot of wisdom because I still had brown hair at that moment. So that's about 16 years ago. And when I see Corey up here speaking, it blesses me so much. And the other young guy, Jake, that's beside him is now in St. Louis leading worship in ministry on a pastoral team in St. Louis. My son, Matt, he's going to be part of the startup in Owensville. My son, Matt, took a little different trip than some of them did. Corey had his own way. And, Corey, you know, Corey told you the story about how he sought after finances and being set and ready to go. And, and Jake just got on fire and just stayed. And he just followed after ministry. And my son got his little wide turn. He took a little wider turn to get there. But when I see that church, it made me realize even yesterday as God asked me to speak into the young people, I want to tell you, church, that we've got, a, we've got a lot of work ahead of us. And God is raising up people. God is raising up young men and women to take the flame, to carry it on to the next generation. And yesterday, I'm going to kind of jump my notes just for a moment. Yesterday, when God had me speak into that younger generation, about a year ago, God began to work on me. About that it's okay to get older. I'm 52. I know I don't look it. You could have said amen. I look like 30. I know. Amen. <laughs> you had your chance. Never mind. Um, <laughs> but but what, we, what we did was, is as I, a year ago, God began to say, you know, talking about the wisdom and the things that we've been through as pastors, but as in, a, in our marriages and, and relationships and all the different things we've been a part of. I want to pour that into whoever it is because I don't want to take those things to the grave with me. What good are they if we take all that to the grave and don't use it for anything? We need to give a purpose for the pain and all the things that we did. Don't let the enemy have the victory over that because what the enemy meant for harm, God is able to turn around and use it for good. Don't hold it in. Let it out and let somebody say, I've been there, done that. So as we poured into that generation yesterday, God, I mean, he, he touched me. And I said, God, here's the thing. I don't have to be the man anymore. I don't 
don't have to be the guy up front. I don't have to be the guy that's doing this or that. I said, I don't have to be the guy leading the charge. All that I ask is that you let me be part of the charge. Church, we all need to be part of the charge that's about to take place. Because the Bible says that the gates of hell will not prevail. And it's about time for the church to attack the gates of hell and say, no longer will you take from us. No longer will you hold this property from us. No longer will you take our children. No longer will you take our marriages. It's time for the church to say, this is our time. And we're going to go after what the God's got. Amen. I want to read you a set of scripture. And my message today is called New Wine. And if you've started visiting last week, you got to be, you're like, this is the church for me. <laughs> Last week, they talked about filling the vats with wine. This week, they're giving out new wine. I mean, this is it. <laughs> Don't get too excited too fast. No, this, this today is what God is talking about, is about pouring out a, a spiritual wine. A new batch of his spirit that this generation needs to see. The, 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 the generation, I'm going to say us, we don't need to hear the stories of what God used to do anymore. We live in a generation that needs to see what God is doing now. We need the fresh bread that comes out of the oven. How many? I remember when we talked about this before. We used to go to Rolla and they had the, the bread company up there, the wholesome bread company. Oh, you drive through Rolla and just, oh, that fresh bread was cooking. You just, you just wanted to run in there and just take a loaf of it and take it home with you, you know. I, want, I love the fresh bread. How many has ever had homemade bread? And how many has ever went to the store and bought a loaf of bread? Which one would you rather have? I don't want yesterday's bread. I want today's bread. Amen. We need today's bread. First set of scripture that I want to read is in Matthew. Starting with verse, I mean, chapter 9, verse 14. And like I said, Matthew chapter 9. If I can help you out, it's on page 1156. <laughs> it says, Then the disciples of John came to him, meaning Jesus, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Can the friends of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast. No one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch pulls away from the garment, and the tear is made even worse. Nor do people put new wine into old wine skins, or else the wine skins break, and the wine is spilled, and the wine skins are ruined, but they put new wine into new wine skins, both are preserved. God is looking to make us into new wine skins so that he can pour the new wine into us. Because there are people in this world, you know, the, the things that we face today, the Bible says there's nothing new under the sun. But let me tell you something. The enemy is on a rant like never before that we've ever witnessed on being on this earth. You see the pouring out of addiction. You see the pouring out of all the things on TV, pornography, all these things. And social media is great, don't get me wrong, but it can also be used. The enemy can use it just like God can. So he's pouring all these things out, not just what we would call illegal drugs, but over-the-counter things and all these things that are just seem like they're engulfing the people. And we get to a place where we just want to throw our hands in the air and say, we give up. It's too overwhelming. How many ever felt like that? Let me tell you something. We serve a big God, church. And the Bible says where sin abounds, God grace abounds even more. So what that tells me is that the God that we serve is bigger than anything the enemy can throw at us. Amen? I mean, was, here's the bottom line. The enemy was defeated 2,000 years ago when Jesus went. It says he conquered death, hell, and the grave. See, the enemy's on a rant right now because I believe he knows that the time is near. Church, I believe that we're in the last days. I believe that. When you see what's going on, of the great outpouring of things that are going on, not just for the evil, but I believe God's spirit that's being poured out like unlike ever before, if we'll just step into it. He wants to pour the new wine. But what he needs to do is he needs to do, and this hit me a while ago, right over there. I was standing there, and I was thinking about this message. And I love when God continues just to build and all those things he did yesterday. My message has been this for a while, but yesterday throughout what we went, we went into a, like I said, we was at Dave and Buster's for, from 1030 to uh, about 5, a little after 5. And then some friends of ours go to church in St. Louis called New Kingdom Church. 
and they've been wanting us to come up. And, you know, I was tired, and I had my spiritual mindset, my religious mindset. I've got to get home. I've got to study. I've got to do this. I've did the book. You know, and Johnny goes, let's just go for the praise and worship. It was about 20, 20 minutes away. I said, okay. Well, we got there. Needless to say, the Spirit of God wouldn't let me leave. And we ended up getting home about 10, 15, 10, 30 last night. Amen. So God, is there, there's, and I'll, I'll explain why that is so important. But something that God told me about my own life was when I, when I was delivered from alcohol. You see, I thought that was the greatest miracle. But God took me deeper yesterday. And it, that was 28 years ago. But God showed me yesterday that he took more than just my desire for alcohol away from me. See, what happens sometimes, church, is we're so excited and we're okay with being delivered that we celebrate the deliverance, but we don't let God take it to the next step where he brings healing. See, what I found out, and this, this is 20 years, 28 years in the making of where God showed me this yesterday. Because the new wine that he poured into me 28 years ago, I gave him my word. I said, God, if you'll deliver me from this addiction, I will serve you for the rest of my life. And as I said in that church service last night, he said, here's the thing. Yes, I delivered you from alcohol. But I did even greater than that. I healed you from the reason why you took the alcohol. Amen. Church, we can't just be satisfied with being delivered from something. God wants to go much deeper than that and take us into the next step where he heals us from that. Because see what happened is, what would have happened if God would have, see, if God would have, what my hurt was, I was angry at God because he, I thought he took my mom away. I thought he had, all these things, our family had fallen apart. I was very young and all these things had happened and I was angry at God. So I blame God. The enemy's so good at us getting our fingers pointed at God saying, God, you did this. You broke my heart. You destroyed my life. But see, the, the Bible tells us very clearly that the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And Jesus said, but I come to give you life and life more abundantly. Amen? See, if the enemy can make you believe and get you to doubt that perfect love that God has for us, John tells us what? The perfect love cast out all fears. See, I had a fear that I couldn't trust God because I seen what God did. I seen what God did. I didn't want that again. Well, what God showed me last night, he said, see, if, if I'd have just delivered you, you would have found another way to cover the pain. You would have found another addiction to cover that pain. So I had to do more than just deliver you from alcohol. I had to go a little bit deeper, and I had to take the pain. See, I thought I was, I thought I was destined to live, I have a sad life. And I learned this, that we will have sad days, but we don't have to have a sad life. And that day I realized that God took my sadness and he turned it into gladness. And he took my scars and turned them into stars that they can shine for him to say, this is what God did for me and what he does for one, he will do for someone else. Amen. So he is no respecter of persons. What he did for me, he can do for you. But here's the deal. Whenever, and I was, this was in August of 91. I was trying to serve, I was, I, was, I mean, I'd pour my heart out and I would cry and I wanted to change, but I didn't know how. And this kind of backing up for just a moment to let you see what this is about the new wine. Because I began to just look at this and I was like, God, you just got to deliver me. I can't do this. And I was serving. I was going to church and I was trying. But what I didn't realize is there was a part of the old that God had to get rid of before he could pour in the new. And what he showed me was on that, memorial, that uh, Veterans Day weekend where I was trying to drink and I was trying to do all this stuff. It didn't even taste any good anymore. I couldn't even drink. It was like trying to swallow gravel. And what happened was, as I set that down that day, and I said, God, you did it. See, I seen the surface, but God seen the inner. And he went much deeper than that. And he took out the, because I wanted to serve him. But what I didn't realize was, until I was willing to be that new wine skin, he couldn't put the new wine in because I, would, I wouldn't use it the right way. I, wouldn't be, I would still be working in the flesh. I would still be trying to use the spiritual aspects, but trying to do it in a fleshly way. Where God says, you know what? I'm going to take out, and, I'm gonna, and I, I said that day, he took out the old wine skin. He Put in the new wine skin, which was my heart. He softened that heart. He put a heart of flesh in place of that heart of stone. And he said, now I can pour in the new wine. And I can use you for the vessel that I need you to be. Went back to church. Guess what? I got asked to be the praise and worship leader.
and God began to just minister and God began to work. We began to grow and our ministry at that time started. God is so good, church. He sees much bigger, much further than you and I can. And he wants to do the same for you. Don't be willing just to be delivered. Let God take it to the next step and let him heal you from that. Amen. How many ever, if you pull up a dandelion, if you're a lawn guy, you know you got to get, you, you can't just pull the top flower off because the root's still there. And what happens is you ever mow over it and the next day you look out in your yard and there's like all these, you're like, what happened? There's more dandelions now than there was when I mowed yesterday. What happens is you got to get the whole root or it comes back. Church, if you don't allow God to do only what he can do and get the whole root out, it's going to come back. And you will deal with it and deal with it until you allow God to take care of it. Amen? We serve a good God. Is this okay right now? Ezekiel 36, 26 through 28 says this. This is a little different than this morning, but I'm just letting God do what God wants to do. Ezekiel 36, starting with verse 26 through 28. He says, I will give you a new heart. See, that day... Truly, that day in November 1991, God gave me a heart transplant that day. He said, I will put a new spirit within you. And I will take the heart of stone out and I will put a, of your flesh, but I will give you a heart of flesh. In other words, he's saying, you're going to have to learn how to feel again. You're going to have to learn to let yourself be loved again. You're going to have to learn how to love and not take and not hold them back because you're afraid you're going to get hurt or you're going to get wounded again. Because, church, if we ever take a, a chance to truly love, you always take that chance in being hurt. we got a world out there that needs you to love them unconditionally. you got a world out there that's going to do everything they can do to hurt you. And they don't even mean it. But they're caught up in this thing that can't get out of they're caught up in this vicious circle of doing the same thing over and over in sanity they try to do the same thing expecting different results the only result that's going to change is when they are introduced to Jesus Christ that's the only thing that separates you and I from the world is one decision that we've accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and our Savior not just our Savior but our Lord that he leads and he guides and he directs our steps I love this. And verse 27 says, I will put my spirit within you and, you and it will cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. Then you shall dwell in the land that I have given your fathers. You shall be my people and I will be your God. Amen. Not your neighbor's God. Listen to me. You can't live off mom and dad's God. You can't live off your neighbor's God. He has to be your God. can't live off my God. You can't live off Pastor Kenny's God. He's got to be your God. You got to have that relationship with him for yourself. The Bible tells us what? To work out our salvation with fear and trembling. And that's not a way to say you're afraid of God, but it's holding God in reverence where he deserves to be high and lifted up. He don't deserve to be number two. He don't deserve to be number three. He needs to be and wants to be and desires to be number one in your life. See, I desire now to give him my best because I realize I'm reminded that he gave his best 2,000 years ago. He could have gave anybody to take the place, but he didn't. He said, I want you to know how much I love you, so I'm going to send the very best that I've got for you. I'm going to send my son. I'm going to send my son for you and you and you. You were on his mind when he was on that cross. Amen. And we serve a good God today, church. I want to just read another, uh, just kind of share a little story here real quick. Whenever you're going through those moments, and it looks like that the things that you were in the middle of, See, because whenever I wanted to get out of what I was in, I focused on what I was in instead of how to get out of it. The thing that you focus and the thing that you worship the most will be the thing that's the greatest in your life. The thing you point your attention to will be the thing that holds your attention the most. 
So you can either put your attention towards your problems or you can put your attention towards the answer. Not an an, not a answer, the answer, which is Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. Not a way, the way. And he's a loving God. He sends his grace and his mercy to wrap. The Bible tells us that he draws with his loving kindness. God's not angry anymore, church. Look at your neighbor and say, he's not mad at you anymore. He spent his anger on the cross 2,000 years ago. Amen? Jesus wore, bore your shame, your guilt. You don't have to be guilty. You don't have to live in shame any longer about the things that you did because Jesus took the price. He paid a price that he did not owe. And you, you owed a debt that you could not pay. But God says, I'm going to make it right. He became the bridge. Amen? So when you're going through life and all of a sudden you think, man, things are just way too big for me. How many of you ever felt like things are way too big? You ever feel like things are big? In Kings, there's a story. and I'm going to close out. I've kind of changed my message a little bit. I'm going to finish up with something in a moment. Elijah and his servant were being chased and followed after the, by the king because they was after the man of God. How many of you ever felt like some, someone was after you? The devil's always after his church. He's like a roaring lion seeking who he may devour. So finally in Dotham, the, uh, the, uh, the army finds where, where Elijah is in this house. And all of a sudden the next morning, his servant goes outside. And he walks outside and he looks up and he sees the army of the king surrounding the city. And he freaks out. How many ever freaked out before? How many ever felt like you were overwhelmed? Well, all of a sudden, he runs in. He asks, he asks like, what do we do? What are we going to do? And I love it because Elijah's like, come here. Let me show you something. So he goes outside, and he says this. He says, God, open the eyes of my servant. He wasn't talking about the physical eyes. He's talking about the spiritual eyes. And as he did that, he looked up and he realized then that the army of God, the chariots of fire, surrounded the enemy. Remember this, whenever you're going through those times where the devil says you're not going to make it, you just remind yourself that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Amen. That he was conquered 2,000 years ago by what Jesus did on the cross. He doesn't want you to know that today, that you are worth everything to God. And that God's got a great, a great, a great plan for your life. Two stories I want to end with today. In 1887, a gentleman by the name of William Borton was born. He was born into a family, a very wealthy family that had uh, silver mines in Colorado. So they were at, they, and at that time, when they, then they moved into Chicago to set up their empire. And as he was, when he graduated high school, his dad sent him on a worldwide tour to get to see the whole world. And while he was on that trip, he began to see that there was great need in the world, that everybody wasn't as well off as they were. So when he came back home, before he went to college, he was talking to one of his friends, and he says, you know what? He began to talk about this. He says, I think God's called me into missions. And his friend says, you're a fool. You've got everything that everybody could want, and you're going to be a missionary? Later, as he went into life, and he went into, um, he went into Princeton. I'm sorry, he went to Yale. Then he went into Princeton Seminary, and there he knew that God had told him that he was to be a missionary. And when he went around the world, he found this, this Mansu Muslims in the, in the country or the, the nation of China, and that's where God put his heart. So he tells his dad, he says, Dad, this is what I'm feeling. And his dad says, son, if you do that, I will disinherit you. And you will have no place in the company. But he knew what God had called him to do. So he boards a ship heading to China. And on the way to China, he stops off in Egypt because he wants to learn Arabic so that he can witness and communicate with the people that he felt like that God was sending him to. For two months, he was there and he went through this and he learned all this. After two months, he got real sick. He got cerebral meningitis, and he ends up passing away. 
the newspapers all across the world said, what a waste. 25 years old, what a waste of a young man that had his whole future in front of him. A couple years after he died, someone found his Bible. In the back of his Bible, he had three statements written down with very significant dates by them. The first date was when his high school friend had told him he was a fool. And his friend told him, you know, you have all the wealth you could ever want. And his, his two words were this, no reserves. Church, there was no backup plan. He knew what God had told him to do. The second time was when his father told him that he would be disinherited. The two words that were written at that date, he said, no retreat. There was no going back. The third date, when he laid in his hospital bed about to die, he wrote these two words. No regrets. Amen. Church, when I pass this world, I want to be able to lay there and say no regrets. That whatever it looks like, whatever God's got, he's got me, you know, when he first pulled up, poured out that new wine into me 28 years ago last night God poured new wine into me again so I'm back on the potter's wheel and I'm letting him make me into that vessel that he desires me to be like I said I told him last night God, I don't have to be that front runner any longer I want to pour into that next generation. I want to pour into pastors. I want to pour into whatever it looks like that other people can fulfill the vision of the dream that God's got into them. Church, we don't all carry the same thing. We're not all going to look the same. We're all, our vessels are not going to be shaped and done the same. But the kingdom of God needs you. The kingdom of God needs you to get rid of the old and allow God to pour in the new. Go beyond the point of being delivered and let God take you to the step of healing. Let Him take out the hurts and the pains. Because 28 years later, I can tell you today, I have no regrets for allowing God to do in my life what I allowed Him to do. Because my family... <laughs> We're going to get ready to close. I'm going to read you just one more story. I'm going to tell you a story. I'm sorry. At camp a couple years ago, we raised some ducks <laughs> in our backyard. And they had this little pool that they swam in, this little kiddie pool about that deep, you know, a little blue thing. Oh, they just get in there and splash around. Oh, they just loved it. Woo, you know, they're having fun. And I was like, man, I can't wait to put you in the big lake. If you like that little pool, wait till you see the lake. So finally, it's time. It's time to release the ducks. So I, grab, I catch the ducks. And I, I'm, I'm excited. You know, we built them this nice house. It's got a big M on it for Mahaska. I mean, we, we had it all for them. So I put them on the bank. And I'm like, you know, it's like, almost like a proud dad. There it is. Go after it. And they look at that lake. And they start backing up. And I'm like, you're a duck. Get in the water. So finally, I'm chasing the ducks, trying to catch them so I can throw them in the water. So I catch this duck, and I throw him. I thought he was going to drown. I mean, he's, he's flopping around, and I'm like, what's wrong with you? You were a duck. See, what had happened was he was, he'd never experienced the big lake. He'd only experienced the little pool. See, a lot of you, myself included, we're afraid to step out into the big lake because we've only experienced the little pool and we're okay with that. Where God says, I've got much more for you today. Don't be satisfied with the little when I have much. 
And sometimes I felt like God actually threw me. <laughs> sometimes you feel like that. But church, don't be, don't be afraid to take that step. Because God is not setting you up for failure. He's setting you up for success. Because in my God, there is no failure. And sometimes it may look like, you know, when we, when we stepped down from the church, for a little while it looked like we'd failed. When all it was was God give us a season. And last night he says, I need you back on the potter's wheel because I'm going to get ready to put you, reshape the vessel for what I need you to be. We're getting ready to do a song that's called New Wine. And there's a lyric in that song. A couple of them. One says, new wine means new power and it means new freedom. I will lay down my old flames to carry your new fire. Whether you're a new believer or a believer for a long time, somewhere down the line, we have to lay down the old flames and pick up the new fire. And I love this. The one liner says, make me a vessel, make me an offering. Romans, it tells us what? To be a living sacrifice for God. It's easy to say that you will die for him, but today the question is, will you live for him? This is where we make the difference in our life. By dying, doesn't make it will make some, but our lives will make much more difference than our death will. I want to live. I want to be that vessel that he has called us to be. So I'm going to encourage you this morning as we get ready to, to go into prayer and communion time. There will be prayer partners in the back. I invite you to go back. And be ready for God. Let God go deeper than just the surface today. Let him get to the root of the problem. Take this week. Just say, God, I pour my heart out to you. The, one of the words up here is also is about a crushing. The grapes have to be crushed in order to get the juice out. So we don't like going through the flames, but the Bible tells us that's where the gold is purified when the flame is the hottest. God wants to purify us today, church. So there'll be people in the, in the prayer back in the back. If you go back, they'll pray with you. Let them do that. We're going to get ready to go also communion. This side, we'll take this side. You guys will go over there. So just kind of make a final, you know, loop around. You can do that. The blood signifies, the, the wine or the, the juice signifies the blood of Christ. The bread shows that his body was broken for our healing. As you take it today, do that in remembrance of what was paid for you. As we sing this song, let's stand to our feet as we get ready to go in this time of prayer. Take advantage of the prayer partners in the back. Pray with each other and let's sing this song to him.
nothing All you have given me Jesus made new wine Out of me Let's worship Him, church Jesus. 